All right, so I'm going to give an overview and fair warning. Uh, we're not going to do too many edits. This is going to be a, uh, if it's of interest to you, you can, you can sit through my yamlin. Uh, but this is an overview of how I sharpen and set. Primarily this is because I'm selling my sawmill and, and sharpener equipment, and it's to give the buyer um, a rundown because I'm not going to be able to give that tutorial in person. Um, so this is this, and I figured if he's interested in it, uh, maybe other people are too. So uh, here you go. So when I'm running the mill, I use these gloves a lot. These are just cheap throwaway things. They work really well, got good dexterity and stuff. And for the most part, I don't poke myself, uh, but you know, I'm changing blade once an hour, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, with this, I'm touching blades every five minutes. So uh, I got these, these are just thermal, whatever insulated gloves just thicker. I'm sure there's better gloves out there, but these are what I have and they work pretty well. Um, at this point they're pretty well soaked in oil, but I've been using these for, I don't know, maybe a year or so. Um, I don't know how many sharpenings I got in them, but uh, at any rate. So for the most part, uh, we've got a setter and a sharpener. And as far as productivity goes, I like to have the setting running that's an automatic setter uh, and then this is a manual sorry that's an automatic sharpener and this is a manual setter so I like to have that guy running while I'm setting the blades and in an ideal case the last time I did it I left you know you leave a couple extra blades um, that are set but not sharpened so in this case I've got a blade on the machine that's sharp and I've got two blades that are already set but not sharpened. So I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, sharpener going. Well, it's set up from before, but just slow it down. And I'm going to turn the oil off. I can't quite see because that like, silver block is in the way. You might have to come at it from a lower angle. Can you see it? Okay, so what you're looking for is you want sparks around the entire profile. So in one shot, you want to be grinding the entire profile. Now I don't worry so much about the bottom part of the profile. I'm only looking at the left and the right, which is both sides of the teeth. So I'm looking at the front and the back side of the teeth and making sure that the front and the back is getting sharpened in one shot. Now you're not supposed to run too much of that oil, but you can, so the oil is going to make the wheel last a lot longer, keep everything cooler and just keep the debris down. Um, the other thing it does is it leaves a protective film on the blade itself. So, humidity, whatever, the blade's not going to rust. Uh, it also tends to eat away sap. So the teeth, the teeth are bent. This is to the left, this is to the right, and this is straight. And so we've got left, right, straight. If you notice on the left, because we set it first and then grind, the actual cutting edge is perpendicular to the blade. So we've got a nice sharp point here and here. So this point on the outside left and the outside right, those are your two primary cutting points. This guy is basically clearing sawdust. It's not really cutting much. So this, this point out here and this point in here are doing your cutting. So these are what you're looking at, which you want to be sharp. 
the middle guy isn't as important, and then the, the inside of the teeth are not as important. And you want the, as we showed earlier, you want the back side and the front side of the tooth sharp. Now a lot of people will try to sharpen the full gullet, and if you've got a good, the right profile, uh, that works well. Uh, a main thought for that is micro cracks do form after being work hardened and just running around so many times. So if every time you sharpen it, you take a little bit off the gullet, you're kind of taking those cracks off. There's kind of hit or miss, uh, whatever behind it. I don't really worry too much about it, but uh, it is preferred to give a skim cut on your entire gullet. You notice there's a little magnet running around? That'll circle around to a sensor right here that shuts it off automatically. I usually kind of do this to kind of knock off some of the loose oil that's built up on the blade. So I'll just take my hand and I'll just barely push down on the guard so it still kind of skims it. And then also this wiper will knock off most of the oil off the blade. Now I'll loosen it. And then this thing you yeah, kind of have to hold up with your fingers. I'll loosen it, I'll just bring it to the front and I've got a, an oily rag that I like to use and just kind of give it a once once around usually the wife isn't in the way and that's pretty much it so the reason for that is I don't want too much oil I don't want to lose too much oil putting them on the blade and because it does add up uh, I, I do like having an oily rag around because when I get a fresh when we get to the setting I'll show you uh, but this oil will break away the uh, sap any kind of pine sap built up on the blade or any kind of rubber stuff that's built up. Um, so it does certainly help having an oily rag, uh, just kind of giving a once over clean on the, uh, on the blades when you first touch it. Um, but that's basically it. So I take it. Okay, so here, this is just my door. It just kind of happens to work in this space. I've got a nail that I kind of hang the, uh, the blades that are kind of in process. So this one is set, but not sharpened. Once they are sharpened, I'll coil them up and set them to the side. Uh, but in this case, I, I finished the set the same time that I need it sharpened. So I'm just gonna go straight from the setter to the sharpener. This is just kind of an overflow. So if I need to catch up, get caught up, um, you know, I can pull that blade, blade to the side. So the setter, I'll get into that in a minute. But in this case, just flick around. What's behind you? And always try to put it on these little guide blocks. It does help it go around a lot easier. And as long as you're doing blades that are all the same size, same pitch, same all that stuff uh, and it's about the same age there's really not much difference between the setup between here and there if I don't know what I'll do is I'll just crank this down quarter turn or so and that basically kind of lowers the blade so you want to start off lower than you want to start off a little too low if, if you don't know you want to start a little too low right a little too high because that'll you know not dig into the thing uh, so what I do is I, I kind of support the grinder and I turn the machine on I'll slow it down I'll let it go I'll let it go through a couple cycles and I'll slowly lower the grinder down and I'll look at it and check the grind and I'm looking to make sure it's grinding 
See right now it's only grinding on the left side, just on the front part of the tooth. You want to pick it up until it starts grinding the front and the back equally. See the sparks flying? I see the sparks. It's really hard to like... You turn the oil off? Well, it's just not a, a, a macro one, you know? Oh. Is it still only grinding on the left? Wait, when you say the left, do you mean the left, the left side? You the left side so, all of the when I say the left, in this case, I'm talking about when you're looking at it on the left side. So you want it, you want the, you want sparks to come from the entire grinding wheel. So for instance, if you go too far high, look at it now, you see the sparks are on, just on the right side. That's not what you want. So you want it. You want to kind of hit about even. The two main adjustments that I worry about uh, is the height of the blade and this guy here. And for the most part, I'm mostly changing the height. Uh, this guy doesn't really seem to change much. Every now and then, if I'm going from uh, one gullet to a different gullet, I might need to tweak this a little bit. Uh, but you kind of just have to play with that. But for the most part, once this is set, it seems to be fairly consistent. So this arm just adjusts how far the tooth gets pushed forward or back. So this is your left and right adjustment. And this is your up and down. So how do you know when that looks like? Same thing, you look at the grind and you, you see if it's grinding too far on the... Um, too far on the right side of the, of the gullet or too far on the left side. If it grinds too too far left or right, what it can happen is it can, it can basically tear up your tooth and you can lose a tooth or... Um, well, is you there do, like a distance that you're trying to aim for? Like a dimension? Not really a dimension, but you want the, uh, you want the gullet lined up with the grinding wheel. So you kind of have to play with it. Gotcha. Um, before you turn anything on, just shut the wheel off. Um. So if you kind of set it you kind of have to play with it and find that right spot, but you want it, you want this grinding wheel to be able to sit just inside that tooth. Um, pick it up again. Gotcha. So what what will happen is if it grabs too far on one side or the other, it can tear up your wheel, or it. Well, it can do the therapy wheel, but it can also rip tear up your teeth. Mm -hmm. So this is an, an example of a wheel that got torn up. So if you can see the CBN stuff, it's like diamond. Uh, it should be around this entire perimeter, but you see right here it's worn off. So what happened was I was grinding blades that were not wood miser blades, so it was a slightly different profile, and it was really closer to a nine degree, and this is a ten degree wheel. And after doing that fifty times, seventy five times, however much, it just kind of wore into it. So what was happening was the blade was coming down, sorry, the grinding wheel was coming down, and it was kind of just digging into the the tooth and which is how the profiles worked out that was kind of how I had to sharpen it but it just kind of dug into it and it worked great for a while what but that change the profile of the tooth? it did mm -hmm. it did yeah but see I only had I only had the 10 degree wheel this is the only wheel I just happened to have and this was not my blaze I didn't order them this was somebody else 
was uh, I was sharpening for them, and I didn't really want to do it, but he was kind of like begging me, and I was mm -hmm. I don't know, I'd just kind of helping him out. Um, but I was using this wheel. It was you know it's close. I mean ten and nine are not not too far apart, um, except the nine doesn't sound like it's far apart, but the nine happens to be a lower gullet, whereas the ten tends seems to be a deeper gullet. So the shape of the gullet is different. And so that's what got me is this was the 10 degree was trying to dig too deep into a nine degree gullet and just the best spot that it had to line up in the gullet it just happened to be clipping the tip of the tooth and that was just putting a lot of wear right on this first surface of the grinding wheel and i didn't notice it for a while i did 50 blades or i did quite a bit and never had any issues i mean it did take usually took two times around to sharpen it um, but I didn't notice any wear issues for a while. And then as soon as I noticed the first band where it kind of wore off the CBN stuff, the diamond stuff, uh, as soon as I noticed it, I didn't get through two more blades after that before it got to this point. Um, so once it like broke through, it just, phew. um, and at this point, this is basically useless. I can't sharpen any blades with it. Um, cause I mean, it's still a lot of life left in the grit here, but just because there's no grit, on this side, this is essentially the cutting surface of the tooth that it's that it's trying to sharpen there. So you basically have no sharpening on the inside half of the tooth. So this wheel is for the most part useless at this point. Uh, I've heard that they can be uh, replated, but Woodmiser doesn't know. I haven't found anybody that can do that, but. I know with diamond wheels they can, uh, just like grinding wheels and stuff like that, like it's possible. And obviously somebody put this material on here to begin with, so it's possible to get it on there. Um, but I don't know of anybody who does that service. So if anybody knows of anybody that does that service, let, you know, definitely put them in the comments because um, somebody will be interested in that. Uh, so the other thing, these wheels are about $140 a piece. You can get them on sale. Once, maybe twice a year, Woodmiser will do like a 15% off all sharpening stuff. So that's what, $110, $115, something like that for one wheel. Um, they told me, give or take, you can get about 500 sharpenings out of a wheel. And I can see that. I haven't uh, worn out any mine beyond that. This is the only one I've actually worn off. Um, but, I mean, on, on I mean, on, all the wheels I've probably got two three hundred sharpenings on each of my other wheels and I don't notice any wear and tear um, so time will tell as far as that um, but a couple things I do is I pull the blades usually about after an hour of sawing and it's for a couple reasons I mean it only lasts so long anyway it kind of you know as soon as you, I, the longer you cut the duller the blade gets um, but also when you when it's not terribly dull it doesn't take as much to sharpen it so when you do that you can basically sharpen it one time around and that's fine and you get you can get one sharpening or you know one pass around will bring the blade back up to sharp whereas if you run it for two hours three hours at a time you'll have to sharpen it around you have to run around two maybe three times to get it sharp because you have to remove more material and so the other way i look at it is that hour two and hour three you're using a a duller blade that is not going to cut as efficiently so with that you you're not going as fast uh you got a rougher cut you're putting more wear and tear on the machine and it's heating up the blade so the blade life is going to be lower because uh with the um, blade life the work hardening that's temperature dependent so the cooler you can keep the blade uh, the more work hardening it can stand. So basically the more times around it can go. I mean, the blade can only spin around so many times before it's going to break and they all eventually break. Um, but the cooler you can keep the blade, the longer that will last. The hotter the blade is, the more likely it is to develop cracks and break on you. So for instance, on a 45 thou thick blade, you might get eight to 10, maybe 12 hours worth of runtime on it. Uh, if you were, running it let's say you just took a new blade and you just ran it until it until it didn't run no more 
you might get four hours run time out of it uh, before it would just break. So as it dulls out, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it'll break. It'll just it just won't last. Uh, so if you keep it sharp, it's able to stay cool uh, and run. Uh, for that matter, while I'm on that subject, 055 blades I, t I tend to notice about four hours run time uh, sharpening every hour. So the first hour, new new blade, and then three sharpenings out of it, and then somewhere give or take in there it'll break. Um, and so I imagine 050 blades. They might be, I don't know, six, eight hours, somewhere in there. Um, a lot of that's kind of dependent on what you're doing, your mill, how you're cutting it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, all right, so I always try to start with the weld uh, for two main reasons. One, so you know where you're at. When you come back around, you can always stop at the same spot you started. Uh, but for two, they don't always weld it in the right spot. So the teeth, you know, have... Uh, left, right, straight, left, right, straight. So it should be three, an increment of three teeth. Uh, every now and then, they will be one less tooth or one more tooth, so the pattern won't be correct. So instead of left, right, straight, left, right, straight, it'll be like left, 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 right, straight, left, right, straight, or whatever, you know, the pattern will be off. So you have to be aware of the pattern of the set, because if you're not, it'll mess everything up. So. What it's doing here is it's setting the left and the right at the same time. So we've got two different mechanisms, and in one shot, it's going like, and setting both teeth at the same shot. Um, so if your pattern is off, what's gonna happen is it'll have a tooth that is supposed to be bent to the right, and it's trying to bend it to the left, or something like that. So it kind of screws everything up. Um, I've noticed the cheaper blades, Mumford's, uh, that happens a lot. Every, basically every month for blade I've, I've sharpened um, is off. Every one of them was off. Uh, and Woodmiser though, they even sent me a pack of blades one time that was off. So it, it happens to other people too. Um, but something to be aware of, if you get a pack of blades that the set is off, return that junk. It's not worth it. If you're trying to set your own blades, it's not worth messing with. Uh, for whatever reason, they're going to leave them to you or whatever, you can deal with it. But it's a pain in the butt. So basically what you have to do, if that happens, is you have to have the weld, start with the weld on the left side of the machine. At least this is how it works on this equipment. And pick your spot, run around, and you want to stop it before the weld gets to the mechanisms. Um, and it kind of works all right, you just have to be aware of it. Um, if you are not aware of that and you run past it, it's going to screw your setup and your blade will be junk. Uh, or it'll take a lot of time to fix it. Um, so basically, what I like to do, it just happens that a tooth bent where I like it towards me really nice ends up being just to the right of this mechanism. Uh, but you want to line it up so where the, the tooth that way is on this one and the tooth this way is on this one. Uh, now I pretty much got this dialed in where I like it. But what's really nice about this machine is it's got the dial indicators uh, on the both the left and the right side. So as you're running it, you can see what the set is. Now every now and then I might have to tweak this. Tweak up and down, but it's pretty rare. So I'm basically looking at these indicators. Every now and then it does that. I'm not really sure why. thing if you go too fast on this what can happen is this little guy can jump and it won't grab the right tooth 
and so you can skip a tooth or advance a tooth, whatever. So the other thing is you can kind of hear it not grinding as much. Sometimes you can just listen to it, but the magnet kind of takes the guesswork out of it. Of course, sometimes the magnet doesn't work. So on this thing, at least, uh, the sensor is pretty sensitive. So you have to have the magnet just in the right spot. If it's a little high or a little low, it doesn't work. So you have to be aware of it. Um, so with sharpening, it helps to start at the weld, but it's not really that big of a deal, uh, especially if you're only sharpening one time around, because you can look and it's pretty, it's usually pretty obvious, uh, what's a sharpened tooth and what's not. So, uh, ideally you just kind of set it up, let it go a couple teeth, make sure it's dialed in, put your magnet on, come back. So it's only going to go around one time and then that's it. If you happen to uh, have a really bad blade, and you need to go around two, three, four times. Uh, what I tend to do is I'll try to start at the weld so that when I'm looking at it, I can just look at the weld and so I can stop. If I want to go around three times, I can stop it when the weld gets, you know, around three times. Uh, sometimes it will, you know, you'll notice it, it'll stop grinding anymore, you'll, see, you'll hear the sound. Um, but you kind of want all the teeth to be sharpened about the same time. You don't want half the teeth to be sharpened two times, the other have to be sharpened three times. You try to want to have all of them sharpened the same amount. So while that's running around, again, I sharpen the next, or I set the next blade, and I'm just getting this set up. So, find a spot. And I, I usually leave this up when I'm flipping between blades, and then I tend to sharpen, set, I keep saying the wrong word. I tend to set the first tooth and then I'll flip this down. I don't know why. And when you're setting, sometimes this height adjustment knob can affect how much set you have. So I was a little bit low on the set, 
so I kick the knob up and that can kind of squeak. Yeah, you can move it a couple thousandths based on the actual height. So when you're first going in, you can see about right before this hits the tooth, the indicator will give you an idea of what the set is currently on that tooth. And then as you click it, it's going to push the tooth that much out and then it's going to recoil. And that's the dimension that the, the tooth is now at. So it started off 21 thousandths and now it's 25 thousandths. So that's what we're doing here. We're just bending all the teeth out to an equal distance. 25 thousandths is, um, 25 thousandths is pretty typical. That's kind of my go-to number. Uh, on thinner blades, 045s, uh, you can go with like a 22, 23 thousandths. I wouldn't go much more than 27 or 28. Uh, when you get to thicker blades, you can get into the 30, 32. Uh, also, the type of wood you're sawing makes a big difference. So I've noticed with pine, it actually helps to have a little bit more set, uh, regardless of what angle or what thickness blade you have. Uh, so I just kind of have my nines and 10 degree blades. I tend to set those 28 to 30 thousandths on the tooth because I tend to use those more on pine. And that extra set clears more material and it tends to leave less sap on the blade. Uh, when you have like 23, 24 thousand set and you're cutting pine, it's just not removing enough material. And so your blade, as it's cutting through the pine, there's the sap, it kind of, it's kind of stringy and it kind of builds up on your blade uh, and you can get that sap build up on it. So giving a little bit more set, you know, in, in combination with using, um, I've been liking the cotton spindle oil, but whatever you want to use. Uh, set does make a difference on how much sap gets built up on the blade. So. And so, going back to the height, um, where this, do you where do you want the height of the like where do you want this to hit the tooth? So the eyeball is you want the bottom of the gullet to be about a sixteenth below that surface. So the bottom of the gullet and this that's kind of the it ends up being somewhere around flush to maybe a sixteenth of an inch less. So I kind of start there and I usually adjust. And again, if, if I'm a little unsure, I'll have the blade set a little bit lower because that tends to set the blade less. So I'll have the blade start off lower and then I'll bring it up to size so I can bring it up to so the amount of set that I want. <clears throat> isn't the next isn't that one too high yeah on this particular machine it is I'm not really sure um, why it doesn't really the blade cause still, an issue yeah, it's you know because so you're much. just uh, you just want to keep it consistent so I think that's more just a uh, a consistent location because if that's an eighth of an inch lower or whatever a significant amount lower or higher um, you, that'll still work but your the amount that your plungers are actually adjusted out is gonna affect you know more or less uh, how much actual set is getting put into it so you just kind of want consistency there and so that the best as I can understand that so uh, the first one is what you're focused on I look at first, I just look at the first one the first one is 16th of an that's inch all I look lower. at uh, more just because that's easier to look at it's it's just right there but if that's right, this is this is whatever it is. Close enough. I, this isn't you. There's no adjustment. You can't adjust the blade that I've found. Now it it does seem like this machine, the blade is set a little bit like this. Uh -huh. Not much, but a little bit. I have not found a way to keep it level. Level that out. Um, With these things, like you. No, because there there's two knobs here. Oh. Um, oh, I see. They're just ground roll pins. Anyway. These, these are different 
different size, but these are just pins that set the height. So if I had like a two inch blade, I would put these, these are just shorter roll pins. Um, but the roll pins that are in it now, that works for inch and a quarter, an inch and a half, which is all I've, all I've sharpened. Um, so perhaps this guy, you know, could be Lower five thousandths low, a little bit lower. It wouldn't be much, but frankly, I haven't noticed it being a problem. I'm trying to get a good shot of that. It's like I don't know, maybe a sixteenth above it, uh, maybe not quite. So it's a little off. But the other thing is that this may be. I'm not sure if the blade is that, or maybe this guy is a little bit different size. Maybe this guy is a little shorter than this guy. Um, it's something I've noticed, but you just adjust the dial what it needs to be to get the tooth what you need it to be to bend at, and it. I don't know. I haven't noticed it being an issue. Okay. Um, so that's. I'm trying to think of people's questions if you're like, yeah. not. No, 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 it's cool. I, I've, if you're uh, not in this land. I've noticed it, but again, I just, once I kind of set it up and get started running with it, it hasn't really been an issue. The other thing I've noticed with this particular machine is there's a, a spacer block on this side of the, of the tooth of the blade, and it's just like a block of steel, and then there's also one on this side. It seems like this is just a shade skinny so what happens if you look at it um, when it when it first makes contact there's a little bit of a gap right here mm -hmm. and you don't have that same gap on the on the other one and so what happens is this dial indicator isn't quite as reliable as this dial indicator Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to stick a little shim here that to push this block out, uh, that may help it. But the problem that I've noticed is in this first motion, what's happening is the entire blade is kind of pivoting. So rather than clamping the blade and just bending the tooth, it's kind of not quite clamp clamping the blade as much, and it's kind of bending the whole blade a little bit. But again... I just said this what it needed to be and it doesn't really seem to be that big of an it doesn't it's not an issue um, so periodically I will also check and verify these dial indicators so what I do is I'll I'll run it a couple times and I'll see what my numbers are and then they send this gauge with the setter equipment uh, and basically that just is kind of an independent verification of what the actual set is so this is going to be your more reliable more accurate check of what the set is so if it's out of calibration this is how you're going to figure yeah it. so like for instance i'll just check all the teeth that are bent out so that one's what 21 22 i'll just check a couple so that's about 23 I think I can't really see it as well. So 22. So that so weren't those 25. That is this this machine. So yeah, I, I'm try, I try to get it 25. Uh huh. But you see, that's that's hitting around 23. So like, let's just take this for instance right now. So we've got. 23 and a half and this is 24 that it's reading that these two teeth are reading so I can just follow these two teeth out uh, I don't think the I have a marker I'm just going to follow these teeth okay so that's these two teeth So this tooth was read 24 on the dial indicator. So let's see where we're at. I mean, 24 and a half. So this is pretty well calibrated, that side at least. And now this 
we're at about 23 and a half so we'll see where we're at here and this is this actual tooth so it's about 23 right on 23 and a half cool um so i like to do that regardless of what the number is i like to do it just to make sure my gauges are accurate because there's always going to be some variance in a given blade you're not going to have all teeth set perfectly regardless of how much you think you want it to be they're not uh, i try to keep them within two or three thousandths of each other um so that's like 25 if i have 25 is the goal like 23 to 27 so you want it the min max to be no more than five thousandths apart every now and then you'll have a tooth if you got one tooth that's thirty thousandths it's not that big of a deal the problem that that's going to create is going to cause some washboard um on your cut so for the most part a trough cut lumber move on life goes on um, if for whatever reason you want as silky smooth as you can get it, then you want to get your set at least within five thousandths, preferably a little better. You're not going to really notice a five thousandths variation on your blade, but sometimes that can cause the blade to vibrate. Um, so you want to be consistent as possible. So that's going to give you the smoothest cut. Uh, however, some people, the Pinterest crowd, whatever, like a really rough board. So I've heard of, I've never done it, but I've heard of some people will take a couple teeth and purposely bend it out. A noticeable amount so that when they cut it it gives big heavy grooves to kind of mimic uh, the old-time sawmills or whatever but you know does that ever risk like your blade dipping it can mm -hmm. yeah so when you have your set it's too far out especially if it's more so on one side than the other uh, so the blade is let's say 45 thousandths thick and you got 25 thousandths set on either side it's removing like a hundred and was it a hundred 95,000, 100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 25, 25, that's 50. 50. So it's removing 95 thousandths mm -hmm. of material at least. Uh, but your blade is only 45 thousandths. So if you've got, let's say, 30 thousandths on the bottom side and 25 on the top side, you've got more gap on the bottom of the tooth than you do on the top of it as it's riding through the cut. So if it's, if it's riding through kind of like that, there's a bigger gap on the bottom. So that can pack and put more pressure on the top of the blade and that can send the blade down just a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and all of a sudden, I mean it happens in an instant, your blade will just dive. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes if you got inconsistent, sometimes the blade can go up and down. Uh, kind of just depends on what the set is, whether it just straight dies, if it, sometimes it will just straight rise mm -hmm. uh, or if it just kind of waves and reverberates. Uh, if you've got a couple teeth that are off, that can cause your vibration, the natural frequency of the blade, and that there's a lot more that goes into the vibration of the blade anyway, but this can affect the vibration of the blade, and that can cause some waviness in your cut as well. Uh, so the thing is just be consistent. If you don't know, 25 thousandths is kind of the ballpark. Uh, that's the starting point for pretty much all wood binder blades or whatever that I've seen. Uh, thinner blades, a little bit less. Thicker blades, a little bit more. Hardwoods, a little bit less. Softwoods, a little bit more. But you really kind of have to play with it and see what you like, what you run. Uh, depending on how much horsepower you have, the thickness of the blade, uh, how wet your your log is, what you're cutting, knots, no knots, all that stuff can all come into play and factor in. So you kind of have to know, you know, know what you're cutting and try out and uh, do some trial and error. Uh, so that's some of the cool thing about having your own sharpening setting equipment is you can do that and you can figure out what kind of sets you like and what you don't and and I've I've had instances where I've had different sets like I'll have you know seven degree blades but I'll have some set 22 thou and some set are 27 and I'll use the the 22 thou set for oaks and the 27 for pines and poplars uh, because seven degree works good for both of them but the, the different sets also work good for different logs. Uh, so it's just a way you can tweak uh, the set as you're sharpening the blade to accommodate what you're cutting and be mo most efficient. Um, if you're doing portable, if you're just cutting by the hour, you may not care. If you're cutting for yourself or if you're cutting by the board foot, uh, you may care. If you have a, a customer or client who specifically wants to pay you extra or just that's their uh, mindset they just want it as smooth as possible uh, that can come into play or if they want it rough that can come into play um, 
And whether or not you implement or do any of this stuff is also up to you, but just being aware of changing this or changing that certainly helps out because if you ever run into issues down the road, you can be like, oh, well, hey, this, this Jacko on YouTube said something about the set. Maybe let me check the set on the blade. Um, so if two years down the road it helps, you're welcome. So um, is that basically the process? Yeah. And then do you still use those labels? I stopped. So what you're talking about are these guys. Right. Uh, so I started with these when I, when I got the sharpening equipment. I got these labels basically so I could serialize, put a serial number to it. And then I kept a book. I can't remember where the book is. Um, that I would record hours. And so I, on 321 hours, I put this brand new blade on and I pulled it on 322 hours or whatever. I'd write down all this junk. If I had any nails, I'd write it. If, if it was diving, I would write it down. If it was rising or washboard, uh, if I hit a rock, if anything happened, I would just write it down in the notebook. And I didn't really pay much attention to that at first, but it kind of helped me paint this picture of what does what and how uh, hitting nails, how you can fix it and or how you can not fix it um, and if it's worth fixing or not. So I have fixed blades so if I hit a nail and if, if it ends up breaking 20 teeth and it just kind of knocks the tip off, it's, it's probably it's fixable. You know, It can wear your blade out, uh, your sharpening wheel a little bit more but it's still fixable. Um, if you knock the tips off every one of your teeth, it's not worth it. Um, the that's also how I know about the hours on the thicker blades. So 055, um, getting four hours, it's pretty consistent. Some it was three hours. Some I think I got up to six. I I don't think I ever got more than six hours out of an 055 thick blade, and that's being as methodical as I can, pulling it um, an hour. You know, sometimes it'd be an hour and a half, but for the most part, I was pretty close. Sometimes it was a little bit less. Um, kind of if, if I if I ever noticed it slowing down, I'd pull it wet. You know, sometimes that happened after 30 minutes. Uh, sometimes if I was cutting poplar or walnut, something easy, I might just get in the groove and cut it for an hour and not realize it. Um, and oh, well, whatever. Uh, so sometimes I would also write down what species I was cutting just to kind of get an idea for how much. So your poplars, your walnuts, you could run an hour and a half easy and not dull it out. Um, your standard oaks, it was about an hour. If it was dried out, you might get 30 minutes, 45 minutes for something like that. Um, so that's kind of how I started to figure all this stuff out. And I wasn't crazy methodical about it, but just kind of start to figure things out. Um, so with these blades, this is just kind of what I did, but TN, that was 10. Um, and then eight, that was just kind of a number eight. So that just kind of gave me, an, so I knew what angle it was and then the serial number. Uh, certainly different ways you can do it if you want to do a, a symbol up here for your different angles or you know whatever just have serial numbers at one point I was doing you know 0 to 10 is, is a 4 degree you know 11 to 20 was a 7 degree or whatever whatever system you want it's fine um, that's what I was doing at first this was also back when I couldn't really look at a blade and tell you what angle it is uh, now I've been staring at them enough, I can pretty much tell you if that's a 7 degree, uh, a 9 degree, 10 degree, 4 degree, whatever. Um, what helps with that is I mostly run uh, 4 degree, turbo 7, and a 9 degree, sometimes a 10 degree. But um, the, seven, the turbo 7 has a fairly large tooth and it, it's noticeably different. And the 4 degree is pretty much a straight cut. And then a nine degree, you can kind of see the angle, and it's got a shallow, um, a shallow gullet. Whereas the ten degree, again, you can see the angle, but it's got a deeper gullet to it. Um, the other thing is wood miser. When you buy, I forget which one it came with, they do send you a little gauge that you can put on a blade. So if you're not sure, you can use this gauge to kind of tell, get an idea for what it is. So that's a four, you know, seven degrees. So this is just the regular seven, not the turbo. 
Uh, so you can see kind of the differences there. I think, so that's a nine. That's what a nine would be. So you can see the differences with that gullet and then going to a 10, the different shape of the gullets. So this little gauge is pretty helpful for that when you're just figuring it out. Anything else you want to say? Um, I don't know if I need to like show these these little guys for adjusting it. What are those? Did that push the it So this, you know, if you want to come around, or I want, can you see it? I can see that one right there. So th there's two knobs here, and this actually sets how much the, the distance block pushes on the tooth. Uh, I'm not going to change it because I don't want to mess up my set, but this is just a screw, so you can screw it in, and that will push more. That will set this little plunger farther in, so as you crank it and go through the cycle, it will put more into your tooth, more set into your tooth. If you unscrew it, um, if you unscrew it, that will put less on the plunger and so that will be less set. So these two screws are your adjustments for how much you're actually pushing in on your teeth. And so, like I was saying, the up and down, this knob in the front, uh, that's kind of your fine tune but when you're just getting the machine or if something happens, if you do a cleaning or just every, I don't know, 10 hours or whatever it is, you might need to tweak these a little bit more or less. Uh, likewise, if you're trying to change set, if you want to go between a 22 thousandths or 28 thousandths, uh, you can use these to, uh, to do that if you want to dial that in. Or sometimes you can just use this and if you just, oh, I want a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, I've also noticed with different thicknesses, sometimes thicker blades, um, you need to bend them more. I think it, I think that's what. Um, you need to push them physically more for them to get set the same amount. Uh, but also how worn out the blades are. So if you, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but run the blades. If you run your blades two, three hours, however much, uh, what will happen is those teeth will straighten up. So let's say they start off at twenty-five thousandths when they're new. After you run it for a bit, they might go down to fifteen thousandths. Well, now you've got to take 15 thousandths and push it back out to 25. So that might not happen in one shot. So you might have to run around two times your setter to get it to actually bend out to 25 thousandths. Or you might have to push these plungers out a little bit more to get it to bend to 25 thousandths. So in that name of consistency, uh, if one blade you run three hours, then the next blade you only run for one hour, well, that blade for three hours, you're gonna have to sit and run around two times uh, on your setter to get it to set right, or you might have to adjust these knobs to get it. Uh, to you get could the set over you adjust need. the knobs. Yeah, you have to goes, over adjust it. Uh, and then when you go to sharpen it, you gotta sharpen it two times around. So you're losing time there. And, and everything's then, weaker. Yeah, and now it's weaker because you've run it around two extra hours as a dull blade essentially you're pushing the teeth so the more, more uh -huh. the more those teeth straighten out and the more mm -hmm. the teeth have to get bent back the more times i mean that there's only so many times you can do Cycling. that uh -huh. before the teeth will snap off um so you're losing blade life when you do that kind of stuff and you're taking off more material on your sharp and you're taking off more material and you're losing so it's gonna pop faster it's life on your, on your grinding wheel so your grinding wheel is not going to last as longer it's taking you more time you're cutting less efficiently and your blade doesn't last as long, so your, your overall cost of blade uh, goes up. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting 12 hours runtime out of one blade, you only get six hours. So going back to setting those little knobs right there, you would do that with yeah those. You would do that without a blade and just press on it. You just right? you can't. Uh, Which, you pretty much thoughts? need a blade. You need to, a blade to figure okay. out because what happens is you you have to you have to bend it. I mean, when you bend the metal, it bends and then it recoils. So there's oh, some elastic gotcha. properties to it. Um, so you have to over bend it physically. So the actual dimension, if you look at the knob when it was running earlier, oh, right, 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 right. it bent yeah. it to like 60 or 70 thousandths. And then it, as it recoiled, it settled back down. So the plastic deformation was, you know, gotcha. sorry, mm -hmm. I'm talking like an engineer now. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to overbend it. And that's a little different for the thicker blades and the thinner blades. Usually I've found I can kind of fine tune it based on the height. Um, if I need a, a little bit more, a little bit less. But again, every now and then I'll just tweak these knobs. It's not that big of a deal. As long as you keep your dial indicators uh, tuned, as long as you keep those calibrated, then it's easy because you just crank it and you just keep an eye on your dial indicators. And so as you're going, you can just tweak it a little bit, tweak it up, a bit, up or down a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so I've noticed when you turn the knob, I don't know, it's maybe an eighth to a quarter inch uh, on the circumference. Mm -hmm. I don't have a marker, but if you turn if you turn the outside about an eighth or a quarter inch, that seems to be about a thousandth uh, difference on gotcha. how much it's actually setting. So if you're trying to tweak it a little bit, you just turn it just to say, well, I can go through. No, it's, I, um, I it. okay. The other thing, um, so as far as the two machines keeping them clean and maintenance or whatever, what's the deal with that? The best I found is compressed air just to kind of keep, well, the best thing is, is have clean blades to begin with. So again, going into not running your blades too long. Um, Which is why you wipe them before you put them that's on. That's also why I wipe it. So if you run blades two, three, four hours, uh, they tend to get more buildup. Um, they can like sap. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I got. Well, you shouldn't because you already. I don't. It doesn't happen very well. I, every now and then I do get. This is pretty minimal. But that's something that can happen. Uh, I think that's, well, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. That happens every now and then. But this kind of buildup, um, this black stuff on the outside, that's just junk that can build up. It builds up on your blade, but when you run it through your setter, the setter is the first machine that I use. Um, so all this stuff gets knocked off on the machine. So that just kind of will build up over time. So I got in the habit of taking the oily rag from the sharpener and just wiping it off, wiping off my blades. So um, what about metal chips? If I've got, I don't, hang on, before Okay, oh sorry. Um, if, if you have any sap buildup, well you can kind of see here, you kind of see it in the gullet. Sometimes this sap will get built up on the inside band uh, if you're cutting pine. And so usually what I'll do is I'll take a little scraper. So I've got this guy, or there's also this little gauge thing that comes with the wood miser, or that comes with the setter machine. Uh, I'll just kind of hold it on the inside of the blade, and I'll just physically gotcha. bring it around, and I'll scrape off whatever junk is on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I usually do it out here. And if you, most of the junk on the floor is is that but all this sap you can see it in the teeth there's this other thing so it just kind of scrapes off i don't worry about this per se but that's kind of all this sap stuff just kind of scrapes off um So if you hit a, one of the things I found um, that's really important to do, and I, and I did a video on hitting nails earlier, but if you do hit nails with it or any kind of metal, uh, a lot of times that'll leave a little curl, a little metal chip on the tooth itself. And I don't think any of these have it on there. But what I do is before I put it on the center machine, uh, I'll just go around in each tooth and I'll take this little duber and I'll just kind of hit each tooth and I'll just start from the from the bottom of the gullet and work up but you can hear there's a little bit of a little bit of curl so this blade probably I might have run a little bit longer here's one so you end up getting a little burr on the tip of the blade on the tip of the tooth it's Mostly an issue when you hit metal because that will leave a significant size burr, uh, a little curly cue that is maybe a sixteenth or so. Um, you know, it's it's a decent size. It's not going to affect your set, but it will tear up your sharpening wheel. 
So when the sharpening wheel comes down and all of a sudden it's got this big burr, it's got to slam into to knock off. I mean, it knocks it off. It's You won't know the difference. Uh, but if you do that a bunch, that's going to wear your sharpening wheel down. Um, so the other thing I've done with that is I tend to, when I hit a nail, if it's, if it's a bad hit, uh, whatever angle it is, whether it's a 9 or a 7 or whatever, I'll change it to a 4 degree blade. So for a couple reasons. So the the 4 degree, it's obviously less angle. So it Could do the grinding wheel as a 4 degree? I use a 4 degree grinding wheel. Gotcha. So I change the angle of the, of the blade. Mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, of the tooth. Of the tooth. Mm -hmm. uh, so if your tooth is sitting off like that, and all of a sudden the, the tip gets clipped from hitting metal, uh, bring it to a 4 degree you know kind of does one of these numbers so you're kind of removing most of that anyway whereas if you wanted to keep the same angle you'd have to grind off in my mind it sounded like you'd have to grind off more material mm -hmm. so it seemed like it was removing less material to change it to a four degree than it would have been keeping the same angle and just grinding down more because you're actually grinding deep significantly mm -hmm. deeper into the gullet you know a sixteenth of an inch or so Whereas the four degree, you're kind of skimming the gullet, but you're really knocking the back side of the tooth. So you're not removing as much material uh, when you change an angle. And then the other thing is when you hit metal, when you hit a nail, the blade's never very rarely the same. So I kind of use my... Sorry, we got pulled in with that time, uh, but almost done here anyway. So... Uh, I guess what I was trying to say is when you hit metal, the blade is very rarely the same. So the other thing I did was I kind of used my four degrees as kind of an indicator of this blade is hit metal. And uh, I did have some, you know, brand new four degrees that were fresh, but for the most part, I used the four degrees on the more difficult sawing anyway. So when I was cutting something locust, hickory, uh, hard maple, dried out, knotty oak uh, stuff like that I was using the four degree and it just kind of seemed to, to fit um, so that was also kind of a um, an indicator so every time I pulled a four degree I knew that there was uh, a possibility that something was off whether the set was off or uh, might still have some wave to it um, so I also found that let's say if you uh, say you have a seven degree, you hit metal, you sharpen it, do your thing, and then cut again, you have, might have some washboard. Well, after cutting for a little bit, sometimes that helps fix the washboard uh, effect. Because what happens is when you hit metal, sometimes those teeth, how am I going to do that? Uh, sometimes some of the teeth get bent a little bit too much, maybe 40 thousandths, 35, 40 thousandths, maybe a, a noticeable amount or more. Um, and if you don't catch that when you're sharpening it, uh, basically bend the teeth back, uh, then that can cause the washboard, that can cause a ripply cut, that sort of stuff. Um, so when you are trying to um, fix your blades after hitting metal, or you know maybe you just uh, ran into a cut too fast, something like that, or or hit something, hit a knot real hard, something like that. Um, sometimes that can bend the teeth out too much set. So you have to be aware that you could have a, a tooth that has too much set and pretty much every time I've seen a washboard on a blade it's because it's got too much set um, so just running it's not the worst thing anyway because sometimes that can help straighten it out um, but other times you gotta take this little duber deal and Woodmiser sends this and this just kinda manually bends the teeth back uh, I don't really care for it I've got a couple teeth, I'll just take a pair of glines, uh, linemen's, whatever, pliers, and just bend it back. This just seems to be easier to use. Uh, the other thing is if I've got, I don't really have a good way to show you. Um, if I've got a lot of teeth that are bad, I'll take, I'll take the blade and I'll run it. I'll just hold it and I'll run it on the ground and I'll take a sticker, like a, an oak just a one by one stick um, and I'll just go through and I'll just every tooth I'll just bang 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 on the wood floor now I've got a wood floor so I can do that 
uh, but I'll just bang, 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 bang. I'll rotate the blade, bang, 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 and that just basically flattens all the teeth out. Uh, I thought for a long time about trying to figure out a roller thing, um, to do, like a sheet metal roller or something to just send it through a roller and flatten all the teeth out, and I couldn't find anything like that. And I was getting ready to try to figure and make something and rig up something, uh, but I just kind of got to the point where I, I stopped feeling the need for it. Uh, the only time I really felt the need for it was when I was working on teeth that uh, hit metal. And it just doesn't happen all that often. And, you know, worst case is I'll take it and I'll just bang, 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 shh, bang, bang, you know. Uh, it takes an extra couple minutes. So that kind of helps if you get, uh, when you're setting, t setting blades, try to get ahead, get two or three blades ahead. So go fast. Uh, try to go through, get, get, get yourself ahead on your set. While the machine's sharpening, just take your extra five minutes. You, you got an extra five minute bonus and just, you know, when you get, when you get a couple extra minutes free, you just bang them out and you flatten all those teeth out and it kind of tends to work itself out. Uh, invariably you got 10 blades, 20 blades to sharpen. You're gonna, um, you're gonna be messing with one or two blades a little bit more than the rest. Uh, so when you get to a blade that uh, ends up taking some messing with, just kind of set it to the side. Get yourself caught ahead, and then when you when you're once you're caught up, once you got two or three uh, blades that are set but need to be sharpened, then you can go around and mess with the blades that have that hit metal. <laughs> the idea is to keep your sharpener running the full time as much as you can. So it takes right about five minutes to run around one time so there you go if you can keep it running you can do 10 12 blades an hour if you've got to pause each time and maybe you're waiting a few minutes you might only be able to do six an hour so that can add up and the same same thing goes for if you run your blades a lot more often and you have to sharpen it let's say you have to run around two times well, then there you go, that's 10 minutes. So you just took your max from 12 an hour down to six. So now you can only do six blades an hour. Uh, and then that's assuming you change it right away. <laughs> so I've found anything more than five minutes, if I've got to let it go around two or three times, it's easy to get sidetracked and get off and thinking about something else or doing something else. And as soon as that happens, it's gonna be 15 minutes or 20 minutes and it's just gonna keep running around or it's gonna stop and sit there and you're gonna forget about it, you're gonna be off doing something else. So if it's 15 minutes per blade, that's, that's three times around, uh, now you can only do four per hour. If it's 20 minutes, three, you get the idea. Um, so as long as you can keep that machine running, you know, there's a big difference between 10 blades an hour and four blades an hour. That makes your uh, Friday, Saturdays, whatever day you end up doing this stuff, um, that makes it either go smoothly <laughs> or or take all day and kind of be miserable. Um, so go easy on yourself. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so I think that's all I've got to say, uh, or at least all that I can think of. Uh, if you got any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the comments below, uh, or someone may answer them, or don't know. Uh, but hope this was helpful, and thanks for making it through to this far. Uh, and as always, appreciate you for watching, and we will catch you next time.